Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is a special year as we have the opportunity to celebrate the Platinum Jubilee of the reign of Her Majesty the Queen. Tonight we will hear from Alan Greer of Historic Royal Palaces, who will explore Hillsborough Castle, its royal associations and links to Her Majesty the Queen over the last 70 years. The Royal Residence is a hugely popular tourist attraction in our area and as a council we are proud to have worked in partnership with the Hillsborough community to see the village granted royal status last year. I hope everyone enjoys the talk. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, it's great to be able to talk to you um, with you this evening and on such uh, a pleasant topic um, as Hillsborough and its royal associations. Uh, for the course of the next uh, 40 minutes or so, I'm going to refer to different uh, phases of the village, subsequently town of Hillsborough, uh, and the many and various ways it has hosted, entertained and served the royal family uh, over the course of some four centuries. The story, uh, broadly speaking, uh, breaks down into two halves. Uh, the first concerns the Hill family, uh, from which Hillsborough, of course, derives its name. Uh, who were they, um, uh, what they did, and what was their involvement uh, with the monarchs of the 17th and 18th centuries? The second half of the story is mainly concerned with the 20th century and the establishment of the tradition of royal visits to Northern Ireland and Hillsborough specifically, which ultimately culminates in the recent granting of royal status uh, to the town and the forthcoming celebrations of Her Majesty the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. The two phases of that history are simultaneously woven together and separated uh, by political shifts on the island of Ireland, uh, with which we are all to some uh, to some greater or lesser extent uh, familiar, uh, not the least of which was the creation around about 100 years ago uh, of Northern Ireland. Uh, to refer briefly to the forthcoming Jubilee, no British monarch before Queen Elizabeth II has reached the milestone of a platinum Jubilee. Indeed, the very few monarchs uh, that have done so at all, uh, the last being uh, the late King of Thailand in 2016. Prior to the Queen, it was another Queen, Victoria, uh, who had caused to celebrate a succession of jubilees, in her case, silver, gold, and finally diamond in 1897. In between times, only George V reigned long enough to reach his silver jubilee, surviving its celebration by just a year. The occasion of the Jubilee and the length of the Queen's reign is also an opportunity to reflect upon not only that event, uh, but the royal connection with Hillsborough going back to the very creation of the modern settlement. Uh, just by way of explanation, uh, my name is Alan Greer. I work for Historic Royal Palaces, an independent conservation charity, and we look after six extraordinary palaces. Perhaps the best known of those is the Tower of London, Hampton Court Palace, Kensington Palace, but also Kew Palace, situated within Kew Gardens, and Banqueting House, uh, the which is the last remaining part of the Palace of Whitehall, and the place where Charles I uh, was deprived of his head. A little more on that later. Hillsborough Castle and Gardens is the newest addition to the historic Royal Palaces family, joining it just eight years ago or so in 2014. Prior to our grand opening in April 2019, the preceding five years were spent transforming the castle and gardens to put it in a position to be able to welcome uh, visitors from near and far uh, in great uh, numbers. With the addition of all of the facilities uh, that you would expect, uh, car parks, cafes, gift shops uh, and all of that. Of course, like so many historic buildings and attractions, uh, the last two years have been challenging in ways we couldn't have imagined uh, before 2020. But we look uh, forward to better uh, and busier times and there's nothing better uh, than a jubilee to celebrate success, uh, longevity and of course the bigger picture. Now, what Hillsborough means to each of us will partly depend upon where we're from and also to some degree on what generation we belong to. I remember in my early days uh, working at the castle and uh, being down in the post office uh, wearing my uniform, which uh, very clearly said historic royal palaces, uh, Hillsborough Castle, uh, and someone coming up and saying to me, oh, I see you work at Government House. Now, technically, by that stage, it hadn't been uh, hadn't technically been Government House for around about uh, 50 years or so. But again, it just gives that idea that um, names attach themselves to buildings and they mean different things uh, to different people across different generations. 
But going back some 400 years ago, it was uh, not known as Hillsborough at all. It was known as Crumlin, um, which is the Irish for Crooked Glen. Uh, and that name uh, referring to the, the stream of the river uh, that runs through the area. The largest settlement in the uh, present, um, in what is now Hillsborough, um, was located roughly around about where the Hillsborough Fort now stands. Very little is really known about the area prior to 1600, uh, although it is, um, it is believed uh, that there was an ecclesi ecclesiastical site established uh, from around about 600 AD. The Hill family, uh, from whom the town gets its name, arrived on the scene um, as the 16th century gave way to the 17th. Uh, Sir Moises Hill, um, probably a derivative of Moses, I would have thought, but spelt M-O-Y-S-E-S, -E so hence my pronunciation, uh, arrived in Ireland in the late 1590s as an officer uh, in the army um, of Elizabeth I under the command of the Earl of Devereux. Uh, Sir Moises settled, uh, married locally and bought land. And by the time of his death uh, in 1630, he had accumulated great estates across Antrim and Down, including over 5,000 acres um, of land in Cromlin uh, from Brian Og McGuinness um, around about 1611 uh, and land from Con O'Neill of Castlereagh, uh, the estate of Hill Hall. Uh, his marriage added estates at Carrickfergus, Larne and Lisburn. Uh, and in the, in the 1630s, his son, Peter, built a defensive fort uh, to protect the road from Carrickfergus to Dublin. The developing settlement was substantially damaged uh, during the 1641 rebellion. And in 1655, the estate passed to Peter's brother, Colonel Arthur Hill, who set about repairing that damage. He was granted a charter. Uh, making him and his descendants hereditary constables of the fort with the command of 20 warders. The warders, of course, remain to this day um, and uh, have a historical society and still um, perform um, and um, take part in, in functions as part of, the, uh, of part of the castle and the local area, bringing colour and ceremony to occasions, um, as you can see here in the image of the present day uh, bugler standing at the state entrance of the castle. I mentioned briefly earlier uh, the demise of Charles I, uh, executed at Banqueting House in 1649. That uh, early form of Republican government uh, having been seen to have failed, uh, Charles II returned to the throne in 1661. Colonel Arthur Hill uh, made sure to play, pledge allegiance uh, to the new monarchy uh, or the restored monarchy uh, in advance of the return of the king. And in 1662, he was rewarded by Charles II with the granting of borough status to Cromlin. Uh, in addition to being constable of the castle uh, and maintaining his warders, he now had permission to hold the market, uh, generally maintain law and order and send two members to represent County Down in Parliament, which in those days, of course, was based in Dublin. And from that point onwards, one of the elected members for County Down uh, was generally always a member of the Hill family, and that tradition continued well into the late uh, 19th century. And it was in this, this period also that the parish church of St Malachy's was constructed. One of the effects of the granting of borough status was that gradually the name of Cromlin uh, began to fall out of use and the village started to become known as the Borough of the Hills and naturally enough from that Hillsborough. And so we arrive at the first member of the royal family to see or set foot in Hillsborough, one who of course had a fateful and pressing engagement on the island of Ireland, uh, which is often seen uh, from the perspective of local contemporary politics, uh, but was in fact, of course, uh, part of a wider uh, European uh, political contest. And that of course, uh, I'm referring to of course, uh, King William III. Prior to the famous battle fought against James II, William stayed three nights um, at the castle. Um, and of course, we're looking at the, uh, at the original structure, uh, the fort, um, and that's where he stayed for those, those three nights. And whilst at Hillsborough, he renewed uh, the Regium Donum, uh, which was a grant to Presbyterian ministers intended to recognise uh, the loyalty of Presbyterians of Ireland uh, to the Crown at that time. And there's a stone tablet, of course, at the gates to the fort uh, recording that event. Recognition of the increasing importance of the Hill family 
came in 1717 when Trevor Hill was created Viscount Hillsborough by George I. The castle and estate passed through two more members of the, the Hill family until 1742, when the estate was inherited by Wills Hill. And he's arguably the most significant uh, family figure in the history of the castle. Uh, once again, it was through service to the crown that his reputation and status was established and grew. He was made an earl in 1751, and around about that time began the process of constructing a new home. There are some accounts of building commencing in the very early years of the 18th century and that that building may well have been destroyed by fire. But certainly what we, we can say is that by the middle part of the century, it was felt that a new home befitting of the family status was required. Uh, Walter Harris in his book, um, The Ancient and Present State of County Down, uh, written in 1744, tells us of Wills Hill's intention to rebuild and improve the town. And he said, the present Right Honourable Lord intends to build a new mansion house and has fixed on a plan for a new town to be built in the form of a large square with a stately market house in the centre. And that pretty much remains as good a description of the main part of Hillsborough today as it was 250 years ago. And indeed, many of the smart townhouses and shops uh, for which Hillsborough is well known uh, date to that period, somewhere between the 1750s and the later part of the 18th century. Wills Hill uh, was, a, he moved through a number of different positions in the government of George III, ultimately culminating in his appointment as Secretary of State for the colonies between 1668 and 1772. And it was in that capacity uh, that he encountered Benjamin Franklin. Now, their relationship got off to a somewhat shaky start. Wills Hill, having tried uh, unsuccessfully uh, in October 1770 to have Franklin's credentials as the agents of the Massachusetts Assembly rejected because they hadn't been signed uh, by the governor. During the autumn of 1771, Franklin was visiting Ireland and Scotland on a diplomatic mission. Uh, in, Dub in Dublin Castle, waiting to meet uh, the Lord Lieutenant, he encountered Wills Hill, and he understood that Wills Hill had uh, declared him to be, had ridiculed him, in fact, as a fractious uh, man and a Republican. Now, whether or not that's true, certainly at that stage, um, Franklin probably wasn't anything of that sort, um, seeking merely um, a more equitable relationship with Great Britain. Wills Hill surprised him uh, by being friendly and insisted that he come to visit his new home in Hillsborough and offering his son Arthur as tour guide. As Franklin was due to travel north uh, to catch uh, a boat from Donacadee to Port Patrick, uh, which was the main sea connection uh, in the northern part of the island in those times between um, Ireland and Scotland, uh, he could hardly refuse. Franklin records in his diary that he was well looked after at Hillsborough. However, his bi biographer recorded uh, that he felt Hill, uh, quote, apprehended, apprehended an approaching store and was desirous of lessening beforehand the number of en enemies he had so imprudently created. Um, so as is often the case, um, two politicians not quite seeing uh, eye to eye on the matters in hand. In any case, uh, Franklin had been concerned at the conditions he found in Ireland, um, and uh, this can hardly have uh, inclined him uh, towards uh, the British position. Franklin's time at Hillsborough may therefore be regarded as the high point in their relationship, and the rest, as they say, is history, with Franklin eventually putting his name uh, to the Declaration of Independence. Wills Hill, uh, like Hill men before him and since, uh, married well. In fact, he did so twice, uh, as did his daughter, uh, Mary, uh, who became uh, a Cecil and uh, Marchioness of Salisbury, uh, and also his son, Arthur. And these various marriages brought in other estates at Edenderry in Offaly, uh, Dundrum and East Hampstead Park in Berkshire. Uh, in the uh, 1760s and 1770s, he restored and improved the church. Uh, despite being said to have been blamed by George III for losing much of the American colonies, uh, he was raised to the rank of Marquis in 1789 and died aged 75 in 1793. 
I've just moved through there a little late um, for that part in the story to uh, slides uh, just indicating that on the right hand side um, we have uh, Benjamin Franklin um, and on the left hand side uh, just to give you a visual and just to clarify as well it is the statue uh, who uh, represents Wills Hill uh, the other chap there being David our uh, castle and collections manager who's uh, dutifully looking after him. Uh, construction of the castle, and we're now talking, of course, of the, the present um, castle that we all know, um, was completed uh, during the time of the second Marquis. And it was likely that it was around about this time uh, that the name of castle um, very much attached itself uh, to the new home. Um, the late 1790s uh, was once again a time of unrest uh, in Ireland and indeed of uh, political uncertainty, uh, with the Act of Union um, largely being uh, the government's response uh, to the rebellion of 1798. Perhaps Lord Downshire felt uh, that tying the country closer to England uh, was a re recipe for more trouble, or perhaps he resented the potential loss of patronage um, and representation in the Dublin Parliament, uh, which was to be abolished um, with uh, Irish MPs, um, therefore, um, from then that point on, being returned to Westminster. Uh, whatever the reason, uh, he was an opponent of the Union, um, which left him and the family at that time distinctly uh, out of favour with the establishment. It appears attempts were made to ruin his political career, and certainly his wife uh, blamed his fall from grace, uh, his decline in his health um, and his death um, on, on that um, on that and on, on the politics of that period and indeed he died and um, with the act of union barely passed at the age of just 48 in 1801 leaving his young son to take over what was now one of the largest estates in ireland the third and fourth marquises uh, spanned much of the 19th century and returned the estate to prosperity uh, reversing um, those brief political setbacks at the uh, at the start of the century Two imposing monuments uh, within the town attest to their achievements. Um, the funeral of the third Marquis in 1845 was said to have been uh, the largest ever witnessed in Ireland. Certainly, concentration on the management of the estates paid off, and contemporary reports indicate uh, that they were well managed um, and with a, a state of some welfare uh, paid to their tenants. The fourth Marquis carefully navigated the devastating mid century years of famine, uh, managing to contribute uh, £20,000 to famine relief, which was certainly a significant fortune uh, in the 1750s. So after hosting King William III in 1690 and Benjamin Franklin in 1771, visits by monarchs and statesmen uh, would be somewhat thinner on the ground until the 20th century. The Hill family continued to represent Down as MPs in Parliament, um, and by the mid to late 19th century, East Hampstead Park in Berkshire had become the main home of the family, with others, including Hillsborough, being visited from time to time. It was also the period in which we saw the uh, Land Reform Acts come to the, uh, come to the fore of, of Irish politics, uh, breaking up the larger estates. And as we come into the early part of the 20th century then, um, between 1913 and 1919, uh, the castle was actually leased out to Sir Thomas Dixon, uh, the High Sheriff of County Down. So once again, um, Hillsborough Castle entered the new century with the future somewhat less certain than it had been for most of the 19th. Indeed, again, the future of the whole island was unclear as home rule gave way to the political narratives um, that remain uh, to some degree um, with us today. Following the Act of Partition uh, in 1920, the island of Ireland was divided into two, six of the nine counties of the province of Ulster, uh, becoming Northern Ireland, of course, and the remaining 26 uh, becoming initially uh, the Irish Free State, uh, and then later the Republic of Ireland. From May 1921, when the Act came into force, the old Lord Lieutenancy of Ireland was replaced with a governor, North and South, representing the monarch within each jurisdiction. And it was the governor who gave royal assent to acts passed by the Northern Ireland Parliament and the British government began looking for a suitable residence for the governor, the new governor of Northern Ireland. A number of properties um, were apparently considered. Um, the castle and the remaining state 
was sold in January 1922. It was put up for sale in January 1922 for £24,000, um, which we're told um, is approximately uh, £1.3 million in today's money, um, which for anyone uh, familiar with uh, property prices in the BT26 area will probably consider that a pretty good deal. Um, the Duke of Abercorn uh, that we see here on the left hand side of the screen um, was the first governor of Northern Ireland um, and moved in with his family in 1925. And for almost five decades, five governors, their wives uh, and some of their families made Hillsborough Castle their home. And it's really at that point that it started to serve that dual function um, of being a political residence as well as a royal residence. So being the governor's residence as well as the official residence of the monarch in Northern Ireland. The Duke of Abercorn um, was the longest serving governor, spending 25 years in post, um, as I say, taking up residence at the end of 1925. Uh, and then, of course, by the end of the 1960s, the political landscape uh, was again shifting uh, the governance um, of Northern Ireland brought directly under the control of the government via direct rule. And at that point, the creation of the position uh, in the cabinet of Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, um, of which I'm pretty sure at last count, um, or present count, I should say, um, there have been 22 in the half century since that position was created. The first member of the royal family to stay at Hillsborough Castle, uh, that was in 1928, and it was the Princess Royal, not of course the present one, uh, but Princess Mary, daughter of King George V. And he of course was king when Northern Ireland was created just over 100 years ago, and was therefore the first royal visitor to Northern Ireland. Uh, so he was the first royal visitor and she was the first, um, his daughter was the first visitor to stay at the castle. The King came to open the new Northern Ireland Parliament at Stormont, uh, delivering a speech in which he hoped for good government uh, and peace. And as an interesting aside, uh, George V uh, grew flax at his estate at Sandringham and sought the advice of uh, Lord Craig Avon, uh, the Prime Minister of Northern Ireland, in growing it. In July 1924, uh, the Duke and Duchess of York, uh, the future King George VI and Queen Elizabeth, uh, known to many of us later as the Queen Mother, visited Northern Ireland at the invitation of the new governor, uh, the Duke of Abercorn. Uh, it's interesting uh, sort of researching royal visits in the 20th century and finding out how they travelled in different ways depending upon what period. So uh, the, uh, the Duke and the Duchess in the 1920s sailed from Stranraer to Bangor. Uh, the Duchess recorded in her diary um, of their arrival on the 19th of, of July, noting that it was a marvellous day. Uh, we sat on the bridge and drank champagne and had great fun. Landed three hours later to a great reception, thousands of people. It sounds very much the way to travel. Uh, in the opinion of her official biographer, uh, William Shawcross, a tendency to combine innocent fun and enjoyment with official duties uh, was very much characteristic um, of the Queen. Visiting Northern Ireland later in 1962, but then very much uh, into her stride as Queen Mother, um, she attended the 350th anniversary of the town of Enniskillen, uh, visited the regiment of the 9th and 12th Lancers and opened the Department of Physics at Queen's University. Then uh, she went down to Dunpatrick Racecourse uh, to be in time to watch her horse, Laffey, uh, win um, with her lady-in-waiting, uh, this time recording um, in front of an enthusiastic and record crowd. Um, she was back again the following October, opening the War Memorial business, uh, sorry, or War Memorial building uh, in Belfast, uh, visiting Bally Kindler, and was disappointed uh, that the weather was so poor uh, that she could hardly see the horses at the Mays race course. But in 1924, uh, Hillsborough was not quite ready uh, to receive uh, royal visitors at the castle. So it, on that particular visit, the Duke and Duchess were driven to Clandyboy, uh, the family home of the Dufferins, um, which was being used as an official residence um, for a short time uh, by the Duke of Abercorn, his uh, seat at Barons Court in County Tyrone being considered too far from Belfast. The royal party spent almost a week in Northern Ireland uh, visiting Belfast, Derry, Londonderry, Coleraine, Balamoney, Balamina, Tyrone, um, and indeed also Mount Stuart, uh, where they spent two nights. Uh, and on the last uh, one of those, the Duchess again uh, recording, uh, danced hard until two o'clock, which I take to mean two o'clock in the morning. 
Uh, the visit was widely regarded as a resounding success. Uh, the Duke uh, wrote to his father uh, that Elizabeth has been marvellous as usual and the people simply love her already. I'm very lucky to have her to help me as she knows exactly uh, what to do and say to all the people that we meet. Indeed, as Duchess, uh, Queen and then Queen Mother, um, she would make many visits over the decades. Uh, the King and Queen's coronation tour in 1937 was another huge success. The governor's private secretary, who had organised the 1924 visit, judged that the King had firmly cemented the feelings of the people of Ulster to himself and the throne. For the Queen, all our people now have a love which, is, which it is impossible to put into words. The visit certainly drew uh, huge crowds again, um, specifically to Hillsborough, to celebrate the arrival of the newly crowned King and Queen. And indeed, um, King George VI was the first reigning monarch to stay in Hillsborough since William III, almost 250 years before. So it's been suggested that uh, Government House and the role of governor helped really to bind uh, the monarchy and the fledgling uh, Northern Ireland state together. And it certainly provided a means for the two to get uh, to know each other better. Family circumstances also had a part to play in that. Uh, in 1945, Queen Elizabeth's uh, sister, um, Rose Bowes-Lyon, uh, became a resident of Hillsborough Castle when her husband, uh, the Earl of Granville, was appointed governor, uh, succeeding uh, the long-serving Abercorn. And the, the photograph that we see here, um, the, the tall gentleman um, at the back in the centre, uh, that's the Earl of Granville. And then just in front of him, uh, to his right, um, so to our left on the screen, uh, you can see there um, the, um, the late Queen Mother's um, sister, Elizabeth um, Rose Bowes Lyon, or Granville, as she was in this picture. And I think um, if you do or are able to sort of zoom in and, and see there, I think you can see the likeness um, of, of, the, of, the, of, 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 of Rose Bowes Lyon to her sister. Throughout the 1940s and the 50s, um, King George VI, Queen Elizabeth, and the young princesses, Elizabeth and Margaret, made regular and often informal visits, um, attending church services um, at the parish church on Sundays. Um, and indeed as well in these images, we see uh, the garden, um, which some of you may well be familiar with within the grounds of Hillsborough Castle, the Granville Garden, um, initially that of roses uh, planted uh, by Lady Rose, um, naming, and of course the, the Granville Garden named after her. The King and Queen uh, conducted a tour of the United Kingdom in 1945, accompanied by the teenaged heir to the throne, and it was the, and it was the young um, Princess Elizabeth's uh, first uh, trip by plane. So we've, we've moved from sailing, um, we're now in, in the 19, um, 1940s, um, moving into the 50s, and we've now moved on to, to air travel. Uh, and then in, 19, in March 1946, um, Princess Elizabeth, aged 19, made her her own very first visit um, outside of Great Britain. Northern Ireland being across the sea, um, but not overseas, was considered ideal for a young princess destined to be queen uh, to undertake a tour on her own. But it also provided reassurance, of course, that she would be under the watchful eye of her aunt and uncle. Uh, Lady Granville wrote to her sister, the then Queen, saying she had inherited her mother's wonderful gift of looking as if she was loving it all. Uh, she continued that she watched the people of Northern Ireland listening to her. I saw a sort of change come over them and you could see them thinking that there was something else besides youth and charm and what is so nice, looking as if they were patting their own backs about it, as if she belonged to them, which I suppose she does in a sort of a way. Uh, you must feel very proud of her, darling, I would be. And of course, we can imagine that she certainly was. On this, her first of what now stands at 25 visits to Northern Ireland, Princess Elizabeth launched a ship, HMS Eagle, at Harland of Wolf, and that evening the Granvilles held a dinner in her honour. Rationing was still in place and the governor's private secretary had to write to the Ministry of Food requesting extra coupons to cover the royal visitor. During the previous visit in 1945, the governor had to request extra coupons for the king's favourite biscuits, which if anybody would like to know, were custard creams. 
Of course, just as some of us grew up um, with the two young princes learning the ropes and coming of age between the 80s and the early 2000s, in the 40s, um, there were two young princesses forced into the spotlight only a few years earlier by the abdication of their uncle. And in October 1947, aged just 17, it was Princess Margaret's turn to visit Northern Ireland and Hillsborough, saying in a speech, I've heard so much about it from my parents and my sister, and I find it just as delightful as they told me. She too launched a ship at Harland and Wolfe. Uh, it was doing very well for uh, royal visits in the mid-century and hosted a dance in the throne room. Princess Elizabeth having married in 1947, her first visit to Northern Ireland as Duchess of Edinburgh was in 1949, accompanied by her husband, uh, the late Duke of Edinburgh. Thus she has visited Northern Ireland as Princess, Duchess, but of course mostly as Queen. By the early 1950s, uh, the King's health was ailing, and on the 6th of February, we will mark Accession Day at Hillsborough Castle, um, and the year of the Jubilee celebrations then really begin. On that date, the Queen continues to remember the loss of her father, and the day she was informed uh, while she was on tour in Kenya uh, with her husband of the King's passing and her ascent to the throne. The Queen uh, made her first visit in her new role to Hillsborough Castle as Queen in July 1953, uh, the Northern Ireland leg of her coronation tour. Uh, the governorship having moved on again, um, the previous year she was received uh, by Lord and Lady Wakehurst, um, who we see on the right hand side of the, the black and white photograph there. Uh, they hosted a dinner for the royal couple, along with the Prime Minister of Northern Ireland, uh, Viscount Brooke, and his, his wife, Lady Brooke. The Queen wore for the occasion one of her favourite tiaras, the Queen Mary, Girls of Britain and Ireland tiara, uh, the original um, being kept in Her Majesty's private jewel collection in Buckingham Palace. And that visit uh, really allowed local people the possibility of catching a glimpse of the new Queen. Um, which was just as well because it's reported that on Coronation Day there were just two television sets in Hillsborough. Uh, following the visit, uh, Lord Wakehurst opened the grounds of Government House to the public and reports claim uh, that over 20,000 people uh, came um, from all over Ireland to see it. Moving on then, the first uh, visit of the, of Prince Charles, um, now the Prince, the Prince of Wales, and Princess Anne, uh, Her Royal Highness the Princess Royal. Uh, they both visited in 1961 when they accompanied their parents to Northern Ireland. They stayed behind at Hillsborough Castle while the Queen and the Duke visited, yep, you've guessed it, Harland and Wolfe, uh, and had lunch at Belfast City Hall with the Lord Mayor, um, and also on the same day opened uh, Castlereagh Industrial Estate in East Belfast. In a reflection of the security concerns, um, as they were mounting at the time, uh, the Queen's first helicopter flight, so we've moved on now to another form of transport, uh, to Northern Ireland was for her Silver Jubilee visit in 1977. Um, taking off from Belfast Lock, the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh arrived at Hillsborough just a few minutes later. Um, and of course, that mode of transport has been useful uh, since, particularly for the visits of presidents, um, particularly Clinton in uh, 2000 and President Bush in 2003. And we've got some uh, nice uh, images here of the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh, indeed, um, over the years, the top right hand um, on our screen there, uh, indicating their visit in uh, 1953. So that was the, the coronation tour. Um, I believe the, the bottom right hand one is 1977. Seven, um, and that's them waving from the uh, from the window, one of the windows at Hillsborough Castle, uh, and then a more recent visit um, in 2015 um, of um, Her Majesty the Queen and the late uh, Duke of Edinburgh. In recent years, and in light of the developing and maturing peace process, uh, some of the Queen's visits have been important for reasons other than just keeping in touch with her people, and some have been consciously uh, diplomatic in nature. Uh, her visit in 2001, again alongside uh, the Duke of Edinburgh, um, saw her open Lisburn's uh, Island Civic Centre, and the following year um, she conferred uh, city status upon Lisburn and Newry. 
Her meeting uh, with the President of Ireland, Mary McAleese, uh, was the first time that a British monarch had met with the head of an independent Ireland on the island of Ireland. And that paved the way for the Queen uh, to visit Dublin uh, on her state visit to Dublin in May 2011, which was the first by a British monarch since that of her grandfather, uh, George V, almost exactly um, 100 years before. Um, it's perhaps not coincidental, given the strong uh, personal rapport uh, between the two heads of state, uh, that President McAleese's final uh, official engagement outside of the Republic of Ireland um, was at a reception at Hillsborough Castle. And I think from the photograph uh, there, you get that sense um, of the degree of, of warmth uh, between the two heads of state. Um, the relationship um, really reaching its diplomatic height uh, when a surprised and delighted um, president could be seen uttering the word wow uh, when the Queen spoke um, a few words of Irish at the reception given in her honour in Dublin. Throughout these years and since many other members of the royal family um, have visited Hillsborough to carry out official engagements, awards, ceremonies, gardens part, garden parties, uh, particularly in recent times, of course, the Prince of Wales and the Duchess of Cornwall, um, but also um, Her Royal Highness, the Princess Royal, uh, the Duke and Duchess of Wessex. Um, Diana, Princess of Wales, made her first visit uh, in 1985 and was the royal representative at a garden party in 1992. And in recent years, Prince Harry and, of course, uh, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge. In time, we hope um, and are sure uh, that their children um, will also visit and come to regard Hillsborough as their home as well. Our dual role as a diplomatic and political home continues, um, whether the talks be related purely to Northern Ireland or other political matters. And indeed, as a secure location, uh, used to looking after high profile people, um, we do get other interesting visitors. So in the same week last September uh, that the Duke and Duchess of Wessex stayed with us, uh, we also hosted former First Lady Hillary Clinton, uh, who had happy memories of Hillsborough from the late 90s uh, and her friendship with Secretary of State, uh, the late Mo Mollum. In recognising these long-standing and meaningful links, uh, Hillsborough has been recently recognised by earning the distinction of becoming a royal town. Those links began with the Hill family, uh, from whom the town gained its name and their service in a variety of capacities uh, to royal dynasties from the Tudor to the present House of Windsor. In the 20th century, the castle took up its present uh, dual role of government building and royal residence. Her Majesty the Queen's own links with Hillsborough are partly fostered by these deep historical connections, but also by the personal links and the family memories she holds from her youth in the 1940s and the residency of her aunt and uncle, and also her mother and father's successful early royal visits to Northern Ireland between the 1920s um, and as, as the Queen Mother then right through to the, the late 1980s. In 2021, it was announced that letters patent would be issued granting the prefix royal, and they came into effect on the 20th of October last year. As such, it's the only town in Northern Ireland, or and indeed on the island of Ireland, uh, and indeed only one of four towns in the whole of the United Kingdom uh, to be designated royal. As we move uh, fully into 2022, uh, a year in which we anticipate the celebration of Her Majesty the Queen's extraordinary achievement of 70 years on the throne. It's a wonderful recognition of our links uh, with the royal family. As I draw to a conclusion, um, may I suggest, even if you have uh, been to visit Hillsborough Castle and Gardens before, keep an eye on our website, hrp.org.uk, uh, for a fantastic programme of activities in the months ahead. And please do come back and see us soon. Thank you.